It's Friday night, Atlanta. Time to rise up tonight with Kelly Price and Harry Douglas. Presented by AT&T. Atlanta, how are we doing? I'm Kelly Price, joined as always by former Falcons wide receiver Harry Douglas. How are we feeling on this Friday night? Kelly, I'm doing well. Listen, it's the month of December. Time flies when you're having fun. I'm excited to be here Friday night. It's time to rise up. There you go. Well, it was a tough loss for the Atlanta Falcons at home again last Sunday. It started off strong with the offense's very first opening drive touchdown of the entire season. Harry, what worked so well for them on that drive? Well, I think coming into this football game, you knew the strength of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense was going to be their front seven, right, in the middle of the football field. So the Falcons did a great job of getting things on the perimeter in the run game, in the pass game, and then it was finished off by Mike Davis for a run as well on the outside zone play. So shout out to Arthur Smith, shout out to this offense for putting together a great drive and scoring a touchdown on the first one. But then there were no more touchdowns for Atlanta's offense the rest of the day. That's just not going to cut it against the defending Super Bowl champions. I felt like on that third drive after they got down to that one yard line only ended up with a field goal there. That's when the game just really started to get away from them. If they'd come away with a touchdown there, maybe it's just a different ball game at that point. The loss was really just a culmination of a lot of missed opportunities like that Sunday, right? Yeah, Kelly, they had a lot of missed opportunities. You've seen some drop balls earlier and then on third downs after drop balls, the Falcons didn't get first downs. But you mentioned that drive when they had first and goal. I think it was first and goal first from like a three-yard line. They got a penalty. The Buccaneers did. So it was first and goal inside the one-yard line. They tried to pass the football incomplete. Second down play, Matt Ryan fumbles the snap, and then it was just disarray from there. So if you score a touchdown there, it's even a different ball game. Outside of Marlon Davidson's pick six, which Harry will get to in his film room later on, Tom Brady and company just pretty much had their way with this defense. Chris Godwin set some records. Brady and Gronk moved up to second all-time for touchdowns between a quarterback and receiver. All these kinds of things just seem to always happen against the Falcons at this point. But the Falcons' D got only five stops on third down and none on fourth down, and on the one fourth down attempt. Yeah, third downs was, was not the defense's friend. The Buccaneers were 8 for 13, but I want to point to a particular drive. It was about five minutes left in the third quarter, right? The Buccaneers had a third and two. Uh, Davidson came in, uh, Tyler Davidson that is, and then Foyer Lewigan could have made a tackle on Leonard Fernand in the backfield, didn't make that. Had another third and seven situation where Mike Davis came over in the middle of the football field and to cap that drive off, third and four at the 12, 11 yard line, Gronk uh, catches a, a spray fade for a touchdown. So three opportunities on that drive alone to get a stop and the score was still 20 to 17 at that point. So that hurt the Falcons big time. Well, the Falcons may still be looking for a complete game on the field or a statement win, but they're continuing to make statements in the fashion department. Let's check out the best Falcons fits from Sunday. Kyle Pitts, my boy, rocking a blue leather jacket. Looks very similar to one that I own, I gotta say. Leather jackets, my vibe specifically, especially bright ones like this. Really love this look. I really like how he kept everything simple too, so it evens out. And not only is it blue, Kelly, you went to the University of Florida, so did Cal Pitts. It's Florida Gators blue. So I like this. He got the leather <laughs> on, looking like Michael Jackson, but a different color. I love it. Sticking with the statement jacket theme, Debo rocking a cool varsity style jacket with some velvet looking details. Big fan of that. And the jeans, though, Harry, not going to lie, looking like uh, Grandma's quilt right over here with these all these patches on There's there. no maybe to it. You know, I took home mech in middle school, right? <laughs> and they taught us how to knit these quilts, especially Grandma's quilt. That's exactly what Debo <laughs> has going on here. I love the jacket, love the white shirt underneath. I just don't know about those pants. They got a smiley face on them and everything. Debo, you Debo. Debo doesn't smile. Yeah, I have nothing against ripped jeans, but the uh, patchwork is interesting. All right, here's Frank Darby with a trend we've been seeing a lot. These like 90s style graphic t-shirts. I dig it. I especially love the pops of red with his beanie and his sneakers. I know you got some love for Mary J. Blige on the t-shirt. I have some love for this, Frank Darby. I love you, man, because Mary J. Blige is my favorite female R&B artist of all time. So you get a salute, you get a thumbs up, and man, if put it man in GQ magazine. <laughs> Stop playing around. Well, lastly, Darren Hall looking like a cloudy sky or something with this jumpsuit. I actually do like the tie dye, but Richie Grant behind him also in all red, giving me kind of Santa Claus vibes with the full <laughs> track suit. I remember in school we used to make these tie dye t shirts, right? You dip it in the bucket and change colors and all this. That's what this outfit tells me. And then you see the solid. It must be sweatsuit season. Is it, <laughs> it sweatsuit season? Be. It must be. The it's weather's cold changing. It's cold outside. The guys are rocking their sweatsuits. I remember those days back in high school, too. Something tells me, Darren. And Hall's tie day is a little more expensive than ours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the weather outside is indeed getting frightful in the firesides around Atlanta. Delightful. As we're all starting to think about Christmas and what it means to each of us, so we asked the Falcons this week about their favorite holiday traditions in this week's Question of the Week. 
definitely spending time with, with the family. Um, but then I'd say, you know, getting to bust out the moose mugs to uh, to drink our eggnog from. I mean, that's a that's a classic. Gotta gotta have those. My family comes for Thanksgiving or Christmas. You know, the family that you don't really see on a day-to-day -day basis. I think that's the best thing. And then we all obviously, my parents are from Nigeria, so they have different foods and different customs that they do, which is pretty cool. So, you know, the matching pajamas things. My twin brother, who's like. 285 pounds he had this thing where we all have to wear like the little footy pajamas so we put the little footy pajamas on for Christmas Eve before we open gifts all the kids they had to you know go around and just say what they're thankful for you know and how you know Jesus has blessed them and um, just before we start gifts you know we just give thanks and praise because we are just we're very very blessed you know to be in the position that we are I love that. All right, my favorite family tradition on Christmas morning, we always make breakfast. We always make cinnamon buns specifically before opening mm. presents. I know that sounds good to you, but honestly, the best part of the holiday season, just getting to see all the loved ones. Do you have any family traditions? I think just being around my family and uh, we normally go to the movies. We normally all go to the movies, whether it's the day before Christmas, the day after Christmas. So I really enjoy that with my family and spending that time with them. That's so funny. My in-laws do the same thing. They always go to a Christmas movie Have to. premiere on, Holid on Christmas uh, Every holiday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Still ahead on Rise Up tonight, we go in our feelings with rapper Kevin Gates. Don't miss that deep conversation later in the show. Plus, I break down one of the shining moments from Sunday against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. My film room is next on Rise Up tonight. We got you covered with more Falcons news and nuggets, including a trip over to Harry's film room. Rise up tonight, we'll be right back. What's up, ATL? This is Ted Crack. Let's rejoin my favorite co host Kelly and Harry, for more Rise Up Tonight on your home for Falcons football. Fox 5 Atlanta. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight for this week's edition of Harry's Fam Room. Now, growing up, every offensive lineman and defensive lineman had a dream of scoring a touchdown in a football game, no matter the level. But when it could come at the biggest stage, at the hands of the greatest of all time, it has a little bit more meaning. Let's take a look at a play for Marlon Davidson right before halftime. Now, pay attention to the clock. It's the second quarter, 27 seconds left. Now, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on offense can easily just run this football and go in the locker room and be, be about their business. Now, I want you to pay attention to Marlon Davidson right here and how he sniffed out this screen. As we let the play play, I want you to see something right here. This offensive lineman for the Buccaneers did a terrible job of selling this screen. So it allowed Marlon Davidson to smell a rat, right? He sniffed something. So he sniffed this running back out, and I want y'all to watch the rest. Great job of sniffing it out. Turns into an interception for a touchdown. Big man balling. Right, so but I want y'all to see the back end of this. Watch the back end. Not only did he catch it, he caught it with one hand. He caught it with one hand. Put that boy in the wide receiver room. There's one more thing I want y'all to take notice of. As we let this play, I want y'all to watch how salty Tom Brady is after this interception happened. Tom Brady's very upset at the hip. Look at the eyes, look at the eyes. Oh yes, he has an attitude. He even looks over at Marlon Davidson like, what in the world? I got something for you. No, Mr. Brady, we have an interception for a touchdown. Marlon Davidson, shout out to you, man, for reading your keys, sniffing it out, scoring a touchdown, doing it against the greatest of all time. Kelly, back to you. It's a great play by Marlon. I especially like the breakdown of the Tom Brady reaction. Well, this week, the Falcons shift their focus to the Panthers, who, even with Cam Newton's struggles lately, have managed to average more than 100 rushing yards per game, even without Christian McCaffrey. Falcons insider Dave Archer breaks, that, breaks down how important the run game will be for both sides in his keys to the game. Falcons stay in division, this time on the road. Go to Carolina, take on the Panthers, take a look at some of the keys to the game. It's a Carolina team. You go back to Halloween, that was the afternoon. The Falcons took on the Carolina Panthers here at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, and Carolina got after them physically, ran the football for over 200 yards, and really limited the Falcon running game after the first quarter of the game. That's where the Falcons have got to be better. On defense, they have got to stop the run game, and you know that Cam Newton, at quarterback, is going to be a big part of that. But Chuba Hubbard had over 80 yards rushing in the first game he will be the featured runner Christian McCaffrey hurt got to take care of the run game make them beat you throwing the ball Newton had a really tough day in Miami throwing the ball against the Dolphins all hands on deck now just five games to go you got to find a way to get a W this weekend in Carolina and keep your playoff hopes alive 
Thanks, Dave. Well, still to come on Rise Up tonight, Mike Davis named the Falcons Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee this week. Victor Prieto has more on that coming up later in the show. And coming up next, we go in the nest with Kevin Gates. Don't miss that next on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truist, committed to a better future. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight, and it's time to hop into the nest with Kelly, Harry, and tonight's influencer, brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. We are here in the nest with rapper Kevin Gates. We saw you were at a Atlanta Hawks game recently. What do you love about the city of Atlanta, man? I, I, if I was to tell you what I love about the city, we would be talking forever, but I'm going to say this. Atlanta was the first place that let me know that I could really make it and be something with music. I mean, coming from Louisiana, it was my lifestyle that I was living at the time was either me going to jail or dying. That was my only two options. And then I realized once I came to Atlanta that, you know, I could really do something with this music. Like, I could really do something. And then both of my children were born here, Waterbury, Eastland, Kaiser. They was born here. So it got sentimental value to me. And then I got a lot of family that also. That's what's up. That's dope, man. Now, I got to ask you now, out of all the cities you didn't perform in, you got to give us your top three. What's your top three? And if they got a little meaning behind it, drop... Give me your top four then. I'll take four. <laughs> Dallas, Houston, Baton Rouge, and Atlanta. It's no, it's no. Okay. I can't say Baton Rouge. I got to say the whole Louisiana, but I got to say Baton Rouge. I got to say Dallas, Houston, Baton Rouge, and Atlanta. Them, like, I, I it's, it's no specific order. It's whatever order they come with. Them four right there just, it's just different. One of my favorite songs from you, bro, all time is your song, In My Feelings. You know what I mean? And a lot of guys would be scared uh, of your stature to, to make a record like that. But So I want to ask you, what inspired you to do that track? And this is no disrespect to no man on earth, yeah. but most men haven't learned how to process their emotions and feelings. And I'm still learning how to do it. You know, it's a nurturing aspect that as a man that you can have also. Like, say if my daughter was to fall down and, and scrape her arm, I wouldn't give her masculine energy. I would give her feminine energy. I would say, come here, baby, get up. I would nurture her. But if my son was to fall, I'd tell him, hey, get up. Come on, you all right? Come on, big man, let's go. Let's keep going. So it's like, as a man, you always told, you got to be tough. You got to be this, you got to be that. But if you never detox emotionally, and I do that through yoga, like every morning, that's my emotional detox is through yoga. We harbor so many emotions in our body, but we don't know how to process. It's okay to feel. It's okay to go along in your bedroom or in your shower and cry. It's okay for things to hurt you because our feelings are valid. And when, and when you don't process these emotions properly, you could implode or you could explode. And that's just where I'm at with it right now. But as far as what inspired the song, true events, like physical abuse is, is one thing, but verbal abuse, hey, you know, it had me not believing in myself for a long time. People telling me, you're never going to be this, you're never going to be that. I used it as motivation. I'm going to show you how great I am. But it was also my ego. I'm going to show you how great I am. But then I had to start putting that love into myself and say, you know what, Kevin, you're an amazing guy. I love you. It doesn't matter who else, I love you. Like, I had to start telling myself, like, I love you. And doing the things that I so freely do for others. Like, I'm just a giver, I got a big heart. But I had to learn how to set boundaries and start giving to myself. Because if I don't love me, how can I ever love anyone else? Mm. And it's yeah. just like, we're, we're raising my children. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want my children to repeat the same cycles that, that I've been this patternistic nature, this patternistic behavior is like if, if, if I have an abandonment issue, so to say, like, you know what? I'm self-sabotage this relationship so my feelings don't get too involved so I don't have to be hurt. It's easier to just quit than to just be brave and face it. So 
I don't want to. I don't want my children to grow up and and me pass on these same cycles to them. So I have to heal myself. Some really hard hitting stuff here. I mean, I feel like I just went to a therapy session and learned some stuff from you. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate that. Hey, thank um, you for having me. Yeah, of course. For anyone who wants to check out the full conversation, head to fox5atlanta.com. We'll post it on there, and we'll be right back on Rise Up Tonight. Hey, Atlanta, this is Head Crack talking, and you're watching Rise Up Tonight, presented by AT&T. Head Crack here. Rise Up Tonight has been presented to you by AT&T. When the Falcons signed Mike Davis this offseason, the Stevenson High product immediately started making an impact in our area. You can just tell it meant more to him to wear an Atlanta Falcons uniform and give back to the city that raised him. Victor Prieto has the story of a well-deserved honor he received this week as we rise up for Atlanta, brought to you by Truist. Though the field may look brand new right now for Mike Davis, the second he returned to his alma mater in Stevenson High School, he was taken back to its older days. Before he attended South Carolina and before he became an Atlanta Falcon, Davis tributes his success to the work he put in right here on this field. And on Tuesday morning, when he was announced as the Falcons nominee for this year's Walter Payton Man of the Year Award, he came back home to pay it forward where it all began once again. To represent the Atlanta Falcons as the Walter Payton no. Man of the Year. No! Not the Walter Payton Award, <laughs> man! No freaking way! I was really just overwhelmed by how, uh, by being nominated for it because I know I did a lot of stuff in the, in the community, but I never thought that I'd be up for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Considered one of the league's most prestigious honors, the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award recognizes an NFL player with exemplary volunteer and charity work within their community. Having the Mike Davis Foundation of Hope, along with hosting community events like his football camp where he hosted over 200 kids from the west side of Atlanta, Davis made an easy choice for the Falcons. He's done so much in the community. He's meant so much to uh, the state of Georgia, really. You know, just to see him getting honored for that, it, it means a lot. And uh, I know he's excited about it and proud for him, but I, I could truly say the whole Falcon organization, and I'm proud for him. I think it, it means more than what people, more, more people think it does. Davis returned to his high school along with Falcons linebacker Ade Ugadeji and spoke with the football team, giving both career and life advice. I think it's important because because some kids need, uh, some people need to hear it, you know, from the horse's mouth and um, let them know that, you know, I've been in your shoes. Like, I know how it is. You know what I'm saying? I made it out from being in your shoes. Like, you can, like, you can do it. Like, it's possible. Don't think nothing's out of reach. Earning $40,000 to a charity of his choice, Mike says he has big plans if he were to be named the league-wide award winner. Man, it'll, it, <laughs> it'll mean a word to win it, man. You know, it, honestly, it just makes me want to do more in the community now. And uh, to win it, man, I, I'd probably be in the community every day. God. Mike's coach at Stevenson High School, the legendary Ron Gartrell, was the one that broke the news to Davis that he was this year's Falcons nominee. Now, Davis says it was an emotional day and some tears may have been shed, but overall, he was proud to represent his home community and be a role model for those students sitting in the exact same seats he was sitting in 10 years ago. Reporting from Stevenson High School in Stone Mountain, I'm Victor Prieto, Fox 5 Sports. Awesome story. Thank you so much, Victor. Well, Harry, the last time the Falcons met the Panthers, it was Halloween. Joe Brady was still the offensive coordinator for Carolina. Sam Darnold was their quarterback, but Carolina still narrowly won that one, 19 to 13. A lot has changed. So how can the Falcons get the win this time? Well, see, first thing, first thing they must do is stop the run in that football game. The Panthers rest for over 200 yards on the ground. You got to be able to stop the running game. Chuba Hubbard, he's still there, even though Christian McCaffrey's not there. Uh, you got to be able to contain Cam in his legs because once you get down in that red zone, he's going to be a factor. And then you got to take advantage of the opportunities offensively. When they're, when they're, when the plays are there to make, you have to make them, have to convert third downs. They weren't good on third downs in that game either. How can this offense really kind of get over the hump of not scoring in the last couple quarters? I'll say um, execution. It all comes down to execution, Kelly. You got to be able to execute uh, things that are being called. You can't make simple mistakes. You got to be able to, to just, just, just step it up. Right, step it up. I think when it, when it all boils down to that, they just got to step it up more. We'll see what they can do on the road. They've had a lot of success on the road this year. Whatever the outcome, we'll be right back here next Friday night to tell you about it. Thanks for staying up for Rise Up tonight. Good night.